ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Stuart Rogers. That's great. Thank you. I'll take this one. Excellent. You just guys wanna, grab the, uh, the sofa. Outside. Nice, comfy sofa. Excellent. Um, so. We are here for, uh, for our breakout sessions being uh, live streamed. So uh, you know any mistakes that we make, um, we can't erase them. We can't edit them. <laughs> There's no post edit on this. Um, it's, uh, it's great to see you. Uh, so we have uh, with us it's, uh, Ron Palmieri, founder and CEO of Leia, and Justin Hughes, uh, VP of product at Nordstrom's Trunk Club. Um, Ron, why don't you tell us just a little bit more, just to set the scene about yourself and, and Leia? Sure. Thanks, everybody. Hopefully, this isn't just the crowd that didn't want to go off and move out of their seat. Um, I'm Ron Palmieri. I run a company called Layer. It's a messaging and communications platform as a service. So we work with companies like uh, Trunk Club and Nordstrom um, to help uh, deliver really uh, fantastic conversation or communications experiences in web and mobile apps, um, again, from companies like, like Nordstrom. Excellent. And Justin? Uh, Justin Hughes. I'm the VP of Product and Design at Trunk Club, a Nordstrom company. Um, would you like me to talk about? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people here will, will know what Trunk Club is, but let's make sure that everybody does. So yeah, tell us a little bit more. Yeah, so we are a personal styling service that uh, Nordstrom acquired about three years ago or so. And our job is to help make sense of style for people. So uh, if you have an event coming up, like you're going to talk on stage, or uh, you, you're looking for maternity wear, or you have a first date that's coming up, part of our job is to help you feel comfortable in what you're wearing and try to find the right clothing for those type of events. So you sign up with our service, get a personal styling assistant, uh, that person's going to work with you the entire time that you work with us. And you can either come into one of our in-house locations where you get a drink, uh, you go into a private fitting room and you get fitted for clothing or custom suits, uh, or where most of our businesses is actually signing up online. So people uh, give their preferences online and then actually receive a box of clothing in the mail uh, that they could try in, a, in the comfort of their own home. Excellent. And you know, we're, we're talking about rethinking commerce and you know, shifting to real-time conversational approaches to selling. Um, you know, this is something that has been happening a lot recently. I mean, we've seen the rise of the chatbots um, ever since uh, last year when Facebook opened up the, the API to Messenger uh, in April. Um, we now have over 40,000 chatbots available. Hmm. Um, you know, that's really started to drive things. Amazon Echo and Google Home have started to drive conversational UI. You know, it seems almost normal now that we're, we're starting to talk and chat with um, of you know vendors and suppliers and, and have those kinds of relationships. You know, what's that transition been like for for someone like you? Yeah, it's been absolutely fascinating. I think uh, it's been transformative for us because it actually taught us a lot about our own business. So you know, look, three years ago we were doing uh, full e-commerce and we'd have people coming in and putting things in their shopping carts or, or waiting to talk to a stylist over the phone. And, uh, and really, when we started using Layer and uh, bringing in messaging, it taught us a lot about our own customers. It taught us a lot about how we were actually selling clothes, too. I think uh, first it taught us uh, the power of responsiveness. Uh, we found that the quicker we were able to get to customers, especially when they were looking for uh, specific types of clothing for an event or whatnot, that we were able to sell them uh, in a much better way. We were able to connect with them and actually uh, complete a better transaction. Uh, but then on top of that, uh, we started learning a lot about what our, our salespeople were actually saying to our customers, uh, which is kind of astounding. You know, if 550 salespeople, and we learned how they were actually selling clothing and how uh, they were responding to different situations, and that type of insight into our own business was uh, totally transformative because it gave us a, a, a clue into who we should go train and what was actually happening on the floor and where we can improve the business and actually see where we can actually develop new technology on top of what we were doing already to improve uh, Trunk Club. And, and what has that done, you know, um, Ron, for you know engagement levels? What have you seen in terms of differences in engagement levels, differences in uh, interactions with customers um, using this route versus the, the traditional methods? Yeah, I mean, I think probably some of the some of the most interesting things is when you compare it to kind of other um, inter uh, called channels. So think about like how you might respond to an email. You get an email, maybe you respond the next day. It could be even 48 hours. When you get into this more kind of rapid back and forth that Trunk Club has been able to build, um, you can make it kind of all the way through a cycle. So that I think that was one of the interesting things. It isn't so much that the back and forth is less, it's that it's more sort of compact. So I think that's, that's one really interesting byproduct. Um, the other is that you kind of bring all the different channels together. So whether it's email or SMS or 
the phone, you start to look at the, the conversation as one single conversation that could actually start with the sort of inception of that relationship. So, you know, you can imagine like someone hits a website, they might start, you know, chatting, but then as you get kind of deeper in, maybe they go and visit the store or whatever. Most companies don't think about that as a single conversation, even though there's a lot of discussion about like a lifetime value of customer for a lot of businesses. So a lot of what we talk about is the ability to aggregate all of these different interactions into one coherent conversation and then employ things that, that have the characteristics of how we all kind of communicate today mostly with messaging apps and those sorts of things, which is driving the immediacy, which sort of ties back into the narrow attention spans basically we all have, right? Which is, you know, we're thinking about clothes or buying a car or maybe making an investment. We're, there's only limited windows that we sort of have the, you know, the, the, the brain, you know, the brain cycles on. And so being able to make it all the way through the interaction to the end is actually a really powerful concept. Right. Yeah, for, for, uh, for you, Justin, you know, what was the journey like in terms of putting this together? What, what did you decide, how did you decide to go down this route and uh, you know, put conversational approach to, to selling first or, or as part of the, the, the marketing strategy? How did that look? Uh, I can't, I, I think uh, in retrospect, it seems really clear, um, but it was uh, a bit of a meandering journey for us, I think. Uh, I mentioned we had a full e-commerce site a few years ago, and uh, we saw some pretty good stats of people actually interacting with product on the site, but uh, we would interview customers uh, as they'd go through the cycle, and they'd tell us, well, I really don't know what to put into a shopping cart. Like, I don't, you look at women's clothing, right, and um, uh, God bless, it's like there are 1,100 different size combinations of women's clothing, and vendor to vendor, those size combinations make no sense. Uh, there's so much vanity sizing in the market. And so, you know, we had a lot of women coming in and say, I don't even know what size to pick. Um, I, don't, I don't know where to even begin. And so we thought we had to do something different. We just couldn't put another navigatable site out there. And uh, we didn't want to get into the uncanny valley of, of some types of machine learning, um, though that's changed fairly recently. And so we saw some other people that were out there, companies like Operator, and we thought, you know, what they're doing is super interesting. Uh, and at the time, our, our sales cycle, to give you an idea, was it was two weeks long. Uh, it was 80% based on phone. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with our, our demographic uh, is slightly more mature. I mean, if, if you're purchasing a custom suit, you're probably a little bit more established in life. Uh, and so we, th we never thought that messaging would be the way to go, but uh, we actually, we built a prototype and we started out uh, testing with a few cus uh, customers and like the initial results were astounding. And we went from 25% uh, connection rates to our customers over two weeks to almost treble that in 48 hours. Wow. Uh, and so the results really spoke for themselves, like to, to go back and talk to investors or our board at Nordstrom and make a case to do this. It was super clear because uh, the profit was there almost from day one. I mean, uh, tell me a little bit more about uh, that sales structure for a second. So, you, you know, you said you had a, a fairly you know, long sales cycle in, in that respect. And was it very traditional sales? Was it, you know, commission salespeople, those kinds of things? It's a very traditional commission sales model. Um, and our salespeople are, are handling all types of experiences, you know, fitting people in their houses, in our retail locations, flying out to events. Uh, and, you know, we initially had them staffed entirely on our messaging product and actually found over time, we actually created a whole nother role um, to sort of raise up in this messaging world. So uh, about a year ago, we started a, an account management team that is non-commission based and it's incentivized entirely on messaging and responsiveness SLAs. Uh, and when we did that, we totally unlocked the business uh, of how we approach new customers. I mean, you know, Ron, I know you've got an opinion on that sort of commission versus non-commission approach yeah. to sales. You know, what do you think that that has, has done in terms of what the, con the consumer at the end feels and how yeah. they're being interacted with? Well, I, I think, you know, I, I kind of joke that what, what Justin built is a little bit like the fit being the fish with feet that kind of crawled out of the, you know, the, 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 the muck in the sense that a lot of the stuff that they, they experimented with initially, you know, some of it worked, some of it didn't work. But the thing that's really interesting is this notion that um, the, the power of responsiveness I think is is really powerful, and so the um, the, the, the whether you're, you've got someone commissioned or not commissioned, it's whether or not their incentives are aligned with the action you want them to take with the customer. So I think a lot of companies tend to build systems that are sort of internally structured. You know, they've got you know regional sales or this or that. And what what what's really interesting when you kind of flip it and look at it from the customer perspective, you know, what they really want is. 
um, high quality service, they want to be listened to, you know, these kinds of things. And so in certain, in certain categories, you're going to have commission people because that's the kind of product they're selling. I think the part that's been really interesting to watch with Trunk Club is how um, this whole segment of, of people really, you know, they're, they, what they, they want is like a particularly high quality service at the time that they're, that, that they're engaging. So it is interesting to hear, you know, to know that, I mean, like, this is, this, a lot of organizational changes have been a big part of this, too. This is, it's kind of a, a really pretty big deal in that it's not just a technology or, like, this isn't about, like, putting chat in your website. This is fundamentally kind of rethinking the business from a customer-centric point of view. That's, that's a very interesting point. Um, you know, I did a survey and a study on mobile marketing uh, last year, end of last year. And one of the things that we discovered is that there's a, a massive disconnect. The first, there's a couple of disconnects, in fact. You know, the first was that huge amounts of money are being thrown into mobile marketing, or what people are considering mobile marketing. Um, in fact, you know, two thirds of our respondents are throwing 50% of their marketing budget into mobile. Um, what was really interesting was that 70% of them admitted that they have absolutely no idea what they're doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, that is because they don't have the expertise in-house. Um, and that's because mobile is tacked on the end as a, uh, a channel, as opposed to being part of the marketing strategy as a whole. Mm -hmm. you know, you've made some really interesting changes internally, not just applying technology to make this happen, but reorganizing everybody. How did you break down those silos, and how did you get everyone working on the same team and thinking about this from a strategic standpoint instead of just tactical and technology? That's a good question. I, uh, so our team runs a very experimental approach. We A-B test almost everything that we do, and we usually start off in teams of uh, 10 or 20 when we're actually talking with salespeople, so we could build a case to the larger organization that this is what we should do. And I have a, a really neat graph. Uh, we call it the, uh, the Facebook hour. If you look at, um, or I call it like the dentist problem. You know, it's, it feels like every time you want to go to the dentist, the dentist is only available when you actually have to be in the office. It's like the most inconvenient thing ever. Uh, and you look at when our customers were onboarding, and they're, they're typically onboarding uh, you know, from like 7 to 9 p.m. in the evening, uh, Sunday being the highest acquisition day to Thursday. Uh, and it coincides, it's usually, you know, we see our biggest customers, and I don't know about you all, uh, they tend to be parents, and they tend to be people, they put their kids to bed at night, uh, and they finally have a chance to, to go shop for themselves, and they want the same experience that they would normally get out in a store, but obviously don't have the time to get to the store. Uh, but you line that up with our, our staffing hours, and when do you see our, our staff was responding to messages? They were responding Monday through Friday, and typically Monday being their, their highest activated day. And that was creating a really bad customer experience. And so we started off very simply. We took a team of uh, 10 people, and we just put them on a schedule and say, you're going to be available for, for 10 hours a day to start with, and we're just going to monitor your performance against your, your peers inside the business. Uh, and you know, I mentioned our connection rates. Uh, you know, we, we saw our connection rates go up uh, like 20 percentage points when we were able to do that, and our conversion rates also followed. And so it was a... It was a easy case to make, though the transition was really difficult to go back to our senior management and say, like, here is how we're going to make more profit as a business. Uh, we're going to have to reorganize around this concept. It wasn't an easy sell by all means, but uh, having the data made that a really powerful experience. Can, can you tell us, you know, what sort of increase in conversion rates? Uh, it was a 50% increase, 56% increase. Wow. That's, that's impressive. Yeah. So, you know, you had the ideation and said, like, you know, Hypothesis is we want to have kind of like an iMessage kind of relationship with people. Um, you've got uh, a strategy in place and you've made organizational changes. Um, you know, Ron, if, if people want to replicate this um, in, you know, in our audience, uh, the people who are watching online, um, what is the, the first you know, step or first couple of steps they need to take uh, to make sure they're setting themselves up for success? Yeah, well, I mean, we've learned a lot by working with um, Trunk Club over the last two years. I think when we originally started the conversation, we were thinking about the layer platform fairly broadly, sort of, you know, add, add messaging to stuff and see what happens. Um, over the last couple of years, as we've gotten deeper and deeper into this use case, we've, we've really kind of much better understand, understood that 
Um, it starts with, with a, taking this customer-centric point of view. Like, what kind of conversation do you want to have with your customer? So it's like, almost like pull it away from the technology because it's very easy to get wrapped up in you know, you know, this or that or whatever. And so, so what we talk about now is imagining, uh, designing, and then engaging in this, in this ideal conversation experience. So we built a, um, we've now built a design system, which, is, which has taken a lot of the learnings that have come from working with, with Justin's team as well as other, other companies. Um, but it's really trying, again, trying to think about what is the path that you, wanna, that, you, that you want, or what is the shape you want your customer conversation to take. And it's kind of cool now, because the technology, you know, as it starts to kind of get, you know, get more mature and easier to understand, the conversation re really is, is a business conversation, not a technology conversation. Um, we've also been working with, uh, we've had the benefit of working with some other, you know, other teams that, like Jason, Justin's, uh, sorry, um, <laughs> Justin's team is, is, uh, is awesome, but there are other companies that don't have that level of in-house expertise. So we have partners now that can help um, companies that don't, don't have that uh, internal, internal team. But I, I'd say it really does start with understanding what is the shape of the conversation you want to have, and then, and then it's very easy to build from there if you know um, what you're trying to accomplish. And at the risk of it all sounding a little bit like rose-tinted glasses, we should probably uh, try and pick up on maybe you know, a mistake or, or something that went wrong and, and learn from that. I mean, what's, what's a good example of, of something that didn't work out the way you want it to, and what did you learn from it, and how did you overcome that? It's a great question. Uh, I think um, there hasn't been a singular mistake. Uh, this has been a, a, a real journey of learning for us, and one of the big things is, is messaging has been an extraordinarily powerful tool for us. It's also a very expensive tool. Um, talk about the organizational change that has to come along with it. You know, we train supervisors now. They get a, a packet every morning of um, what their agents did the night previous, what their connection rates were, transcripts of all their conversations. And so they can train almost in near real time uh, to bring the sales staff along. Uh, and that wasn't something that, that came up overnight. And we had to go through a really hard learning process. And I think where we're at right now, is this interesting point of understanding where machine learning actually can benefit us as part of this. And, and we want to avoid entering that uncanny valley. I think a lot of us fear uh, when we talk about bots and messaging of, uh, you know, if you're going to sell an expensive suit, you don't want to make a person feel like they're, they're dealing with an automated service. Uh, and people detect that even at a subconscious level. And so uh, we've been selectively using machine learning to do things like um, we noticed there are points in the conversation there, there's a lot of churn. Uh, we may spend 45 minutes understanding what your style preferences are. And we can get at that much quicker if we can just inject into the conversation uh, a survey or uh, almost a fun game to collect that information from you and uh, actually further the conversation along. Uh, or use bots to talk to our salespeople. So our salespeople get arrays of different responses to actually uh, keep up with multiple conversations because they're handling sometimes five to seven conversations concurrently. Uh, and so we may prompt them with easy things to actually keep the conversation going that feel natural. But at the end of the day, they always have control over how that gets represented and if they want to use emoji or if they want to actually insert spelling mistakes so people understand they're real human beings. Like, that's all part of the, the selling of the service. Um, and that's been a learning curve for us over time. That's a, that's a really interesting use of the, you know, the, the chatbot, you know, instead of having it as a consumer-facing chatbot, almost having it as a pre-sales support chatbot. Absolutely. Um, which is a very interesting way. I mean, Ron, we've, we've talked a lot about uh, artificial intelligence across yesterday, and, and we will continue to do so today. Um, you know, just final words. What do you, what do you see as the, the future of AI within this, this kind of environment? Um, you know, is it uh, for, you know, from your point of view, um, we seem to have sort of two branches that are turning up. You know, you've got the one branch where it's looking after the high waste, menial conversations, and then people are getting involved when it gets interesting, which, which means that you can have, uh, you know, better interactions, um, you know, your staff seem happier. The alternative is that, you know, people are cutting stuff with uh, conversational um, UI and with chatbots and with AI. So. You know, where do you sense we're going with this, or is it really just down to the type of manager that runs the business and, and whether they want to be autocratic or not? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think it does come back to what kind of conversation does a company want to have with their customer. So I think anywhere where you need empathy, I think that obviously the human, you know, humans, people will always, 
kind of have that advantage over the machine. I do think that when you turn people into machines where they're basically doing a lot of menial stuff, I think it's, I mean, the example I gave is, you know, give is like, like the, you know, the, the United example where, you know, the guy gets, gets dragged off the airplane. Like the systems, the systems that they had in place basically brought the people to have to do something which really did not seem very empathetic, right? And so this is, I see this as an opportunity to flip it and say, how do you give the people the opportunity to do things that require brain power and, and require empathy, but take a lot of the road sort of like, you know, stuff that's really not fun for everybody and, and have machines kind of handle some of that where, where they can. Um, the other is, is that, you know, there's, uh, there's machine learning and then there's what I think of as more of like a passive, like look at kind of what's happened over time. So Trunk Club's now had millions of conversations that have run across um, the platform and you can see how do those conversations convert and do they have the outcome, whether it's satisfaction or whatever. So there's a, by aggregating all this, increasing the conversation becomes digital. You can use machine learning to understand how those digital conversations are performing or you know whatever. And then the other is how can you use the machine to be more of an active participant, either handling a, handling a menial task, routing it to an expert when they're needed, you know, to be able to provide expertise or you know the empathy component, or potentially prompting you know the humans that need to be responsive to to make sure that they're on top of it because the velocity of this stuff is very very high like lots of messages flying around it's really almost impossible for people to do it so you want to find the balance and typically it's around the the, the, the voice of the, of the of the the brand but also being really thoughtful about like what is the conversation experience you're trying to create perfect that's a that's a great footnote to end on uh, thank you so much Ron and Justin and uh, everybody here please uh, stay around for the next. Uh, panel, which is uh, going to come on straight after us. So Fantastic. thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thanks Thank very, very much. much. Thank you.